thank you, uh, Srimanta Mahanta. I must also thank uh, Ms. Sanju Sharma and uh, Professor Pandya for uh, having me on this event. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be here and uh, to share uh, our experiences. Uh, let me just share uh, my screen and uh, hopefully my slides will allow me to keep time as well. So uh, confirm if you are able to uh, see that. Yeah, that's what I want to focus on. Uh, I just added the caption, student-led deep science startups. And there's a little bit of uh, uh, an anticlimax here, but let me start with uh, what we believe is deep science, you know, because tech companies and high tech has been very misused over the years. So basically our simple distinction uh, of a deep tech or a deep science company is the offering itself is based on science or technology. And I think that's the key distinction, right? And because it will be usually based on some breakthrough, you know, uh, that has come out from a scientific or a engineering innovation. And it addresses typically, you know, what are important societal and, you know, environmental challenges. And the biggest USP why we should look at these deep science, deep tech startups is that, you know, because it is based on some underlying know-how or IP, which is unique, uh, you know, to the founders, who have started the company, they have a fairly longer runway, which they actually need, you know, to make a mark. And because it makes deep societal impact, you know, the impact is even greater. And of course, it is not in one field like IT, but it spreads across the spectrum of uh, all fields that uh, human endeavor is involved in, from uh, health to materials, you know, uh, manufacturing, everything in between. So, uh, what should the incubator do then, you know, uh, if they want to uh, 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 nurture this whole uh, deep science, deep technology based uh, startups. So one of the first things is that, you know, uh, we have to be patient, right? These are not companies that are going to fructify in one year, two year, not even three years, right? Uh, you will see results only, you know, post five years, six years. There may be instances where this happens sooner, right? But typically the gestation is much longer and therefore, you know, the resilience that is required on the part of both the founders of the company as well as the incubator is much more, you know, and this is a very important thing. And uh, I think uh, earlier speakers, Professor Desai had made this uh, remark that it is therefore makes sense to be associated with an academic environment, you know, either an institution or a research lab, primarily because, you know, the research, the know-how is there, right? And more than that, the third item here, which is the facilities. You know, faculty in some of these institutions have created amazing facilities for doing really advanced research. And it turns out that those same, those same facilities can give a unique advantage to the startups by using these facilities for either characterization, for analysis, for prototyping, even for simulation. Right? And therefore, that uh, cohabitation is, is very, very important. And the last one here, and I will repeat this again in a subsequent slide, is this uh, uh, technical come business guidance that was alluded to in the, in the previous uh, talk. I think that also happens in an academic environment, you know, through faculty uh, inside the campus and the alumni who have gone outside the campus. So based on this, I just wanted to share, uh, you know, sort of a crude model that uh, uh, we have. And, you know, it's not... Uh, uh, any, uh, you know, uh, uh, novel thing here, most people would have, you know, come to this uh, over time, but I just wanted to put it in one place, right? So uh, the, the startup is, of course, at the center of the thing, but, you know, there are, you know, these uh, four corners of the four sides uh, to this. Let me start with the left one, which is what the academic uh, institution or the academic uh, entity brings in, right? Uh, they bring in know-how, IP, you know, that's very important. They also should provide infrastructure. And I alluded to this infrastructure in the previous slide. Space and, you know, uh, some prototyping facilities everybody has talked about. But for doing deep science startups, you need much more. You know, you cannot buy an SEM just for a startup. You know, SEM should be there. And, you know, startups should be able to use it whenever they need it. Maybe over time, even start paying for it. But that facility should be there, right? Equity, yes, you know, I mean, people have debated about this, but our view is that, you know, uh, taking equity in the startups, you know, however reluctant they may be to give the equity to the, you know, academic incubator, is it's also a protection for them, you know. Uh, quite often the VCs complain about the equity academic institutions have is because they can't push them around them because they have somebody big, not that the institution is going to go and fight with these VCs, but just the fact that they are there behind them gives them some gravitas 
which is quite useful in negotiations and discussions and interactions. Right? It gives them uh, the gravity that is required to engage with these people. So I think we should support that and there must be a mechanism for that. If I come to the, the right edge, you know, there needs, you know, human support resources, you know, faculty as uh, technical advisors, you know, you know, uh, to provide them know how, etc. Students actually form a real life blood because they can go and intern in these companies and quite often that the energy they bring and the freshness and the fearlessness they bring helps the startups also. Right. The alumni, I'm going to come back to that. I have a separate slide for that, but they are a key, key partner in this whole thing. And of course, the incubator itself must have a core operations support, you know, in terms of the mundane things that a startup has to go through. The bottom edge then is, of course, you know, partners, right? People have already talked about this, you know, uh, these can be clinical testing organizations, these can be business schools, these can be funding agencies, investors, all of that, right? The testing labs. So they all come here and it's the incubator's job to sort of keep this supply chain, you know, sort of well oiled and smoothened out so that whenever a startup needs that, you know, they can make this available to them. Then, of course, we come to the top and that's the sort of the real, you know, challenge that uh, deep science startups face, which is funding, right? Uh, typically, the kind of monies that these people, these companies need and the period over which they need these monies are much larger. And therefore, you know, there is a, a very an acute need for uh, making sure that there is a tap, you know, that is available. And we are trying to sort of do this through creating a fund, right? And of course, the sources, Professor Desai mentioned, and some of the other speakers also mentioned, alumni, you know, uh, uh, high net worth individuals who have, you know, uh, some uh, shared, you know, interests in nurturing this kind of activity. But this funding is very important because to put up a startup which is in deep science or deep technology in front of an investor very early is uh, is a case of death for them you know unless they have the you know uh, product uh, which is possibly validated as well you know it is doesn't make sense for them to go in front of either customer uh, or investors and therefore you know it is important that the incubator has the resources to nurture them through this period which means funding to the levels of crore to about you know five crores you know I and mean, that's the kind of funding that must be made available and therefore this became a very huge challenge uh, for uh, incubators let me come to sorry uh, alumni right they're a very key uh, part and i'm sure all of you would have realized it by now and you would have taken steps but let me just put it in here right that alumni go out and they make a mark in the global world right they have done everything that we think the startups should do you know in different roles and it makes sense to sort of tap into that rich resource and it makes it easy because they also have a deep commitment you know to their alma mater and they want to also you know assist in this being in bangalore helps but i'm sure this is true everywhere you know uh, uh, in these times uh, location is not a constraint at all and the main thing is that you know alumni have a shared history with the founders right if they are from your own university you know they have a shared history but it is tempered with real world experience you know uh, both in translating technology, the business side of things, and therefore, you know, in the market facing experiences, and therefore it makes sense to tap into the, the world of alumni. And of course, a lot of them have made money. And so it makes the, you know, sense to touch them for money as well. But this help itself is worth its weight in gold. So our view on student led startups, you know, I mean, it's a little different, you know, we don't encourage, you know, uh, doing it while they are students. And of course, it helps that we don't have a large undergraduate program, you know, and so their stay here is for two years. If they are master's students and PhD, you know, is of course four, five, six years, that's longer, right? But we still sort of uh, counsel them to graduate first, right? And the reason is that, you know, uh, if they are going to be a science or a technology driven company, right, then it makes sense for them to use their, you know, stay here as a student to do the, you know, uh, technology development you know, as the pre-incubation part of things as a student, right, as part of their thesis, provided, of course, you know, it meets the other guidelines and expectations of a thesis, it makes sense to for them to, you know, fine tune that rather than, you know, start a company and then do it on company time, it doesn't make sense at all, right. And we believe that, you know, uh, people will buy this uh, uh, idea that it makes sense to do this, because if you see our portfolio today, about one third is, you know, alumni or fresh graduates. You know, people who have finished a degree and then they have wanted to start a company. 
So that's our view insofar as you know uh, student participation in in startups is concerned. Uh, I just wanted to put a snapshot here. You know, stem cell is the name of our incubator. Uh, it is a fond hope on our uh, part that you know, much like the biological entity, uh, you know, our incubator also anybody who comes here will grow. So you know, that's the uh, you know hope in which we have named it. Uh, but these companies, these four companies that I have listed here, right? Uh, they are all started by students. Bellatrix. These were students fresh out of college in Coimbatore. They are not our alumni. Uh, they just came out of college, but they had this very fancy technology that they had done as part of a project, you know, in their BE days. And uh, this was uh, this electrothermal thruster, you know, based on microwaves, using microwaves. And now, you know, we have incubated them and they have become a robust company. They have contracts from ISRO. So, you know, that is there. Patshod is a PhD student who, with his advisor, started this company. Grass Bionics is a company in implants space and, uh, you know, prosthetics space. These were started by two of our design students. Again, this was their master's project and that, that became a company. Astrom is a slightly different example. These were students who went out, did other things, and then came back and wanted to start a company in this space. And that's how they are. So the point I'm making is that, you know, it makes sense to sort of not, uh, uh, you know, try and be a dropout. You know, there are very famous dropouts, but then if you look at the numbers, right, that is, they will anyway drop out, you know, I mean, uh, nobody can stop them from being successful, but it doesn't work for everybody, you know, much like cricket, right, you, including IPL, there's only so many cricketers who can make their mark, you know, so you have to be very careful that, you know, how you make this decision, so we would encourage them to finish their degree. So one thing we do to sort of, you know, further support the fact that students should go through a, a, a process, you know, to get into this whole game of science-led startups, is this entrepreneurs in residence program? You know, uh, we are you know, sort of offering it as an alternate to postdoctoral fellow. So our bias is towards PhD students at this point in time, but this may also apply to students at other levels as well, right? Much like you know, people who want students who want to go into academia go for a postdoctoral fellowship. We believe that those who want think that they can do entrepreneurship should do entrepreneurs in residence. We support them for a period of time through both financial resources to themselves as an individual, as well as, you know, uh, for developing their science or their technology that they have done as part of their thesis. And the idea is that they, at the end of the period, which is typically one year, right, uh, they are convinced that they can pursue this and they can convince us that they can pursue this, right. And then, you know, uh, we continue the path of the incubation. So this is something that we have started, you know, some uh, entrepreneurs are already there in this process. And we are hoping that we can grow the funnel as we go forward, you know, and uh, run this uh, well. I just want to leave you with one other type of engagement that uh, students can have, which can take them to the path of innovation, which is, you know, getting them to engage with the SME sector through projects, right? Uh, and the um, idea here is that, you know, we provide technology upgradation for SMEs, but through student projects in collaboration with the SME part, right? And we have packaged a couple of courses with a summer internship in the SME in between for new product development that is of value to the startup itself, right? So we've been doing this for the last three years now. And, uh, you know, uh, I, there are several ones, but the one that is circled is the one that I'm going to talk about next. You know, this is, uh, 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 and the, uh, the chain on the top shows you the numbers. So it is lucrative and there is interest, you know, companies are interested and, you know, students are also interested. And so hopefully we can, we can sustain this. Let me talk about this because this is a, an interesting and very encouraging uh, thing for us. This was a company that used to do white level manufacturing of uh, solid state relays, you know, for uh, multinational companies and Indian companies, right? So they came to us and, you know, as part of the project, we identified a platform product for them, which is a smart controller based on their own relays, right? And the students actually did an implementation of this for controlling a polyhouse, you know, a fully instrumented polyhouse, humidity, so moisture, light, you know, and uh, uh, fertigation, all controlled by the single, you know, device that you see in the middle of the screen, right? But the nice thing is why this is good for the company is that it is actually a platform product because they can use this in manufacturing for controlling, say, uh, uh, electro coating uh, plant or in uh, food, uh, things where they can use to control furnaces in bakeries, you know, for making cookies. So the sort of usage is very wide. And so this company is very excited. And what they have done now is that they have spun a division, hired the student who worked on this project for them and as a founder, and they are now starting a new company, uh, which will take this forward. So that's another way that, you know, we can both encourage the SMEs to move up the technology path and the students also a low risk option to get into this whole entrepreneurship and innovation path. 
so that's pretty much what i have to say right now and thank you very much and we have to answer questions